good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon for those of you on the continent of Europe. I'm Dave Deptula, Dean of the Mitchell Institute for Aerospace Studies. I'd like to extend a warm welcome and uh, thanks to uh, General uh, Cobra Harigian for joining us today. He holds multiple positions, Commander U.S. Air Forces in Europe, Commander U.S. Air Forces Africa, Commander Allied Air Command, Headquarters at Ramstein Air Base, Germany, and Director of the Joint Air Power Competence Center in Kolkard, Germany. I'd like to begin by saying that the nation is most fortunate uh, to have someone of General Harrigian's caliber serving as a leader in such an important area of operations. He's led airmen in combat in his previous assignments as the Combined Force Air Component Commander at CENTCOM. He's deeply experienced as an F-22 pilot, and he's commanded in numerous key positions. Most of all, he's a leader who simply gets it when it comes to the effective employment of aerospace power. With that, Cobra, I'd like to turn it over to you to share with us what issues are at the top of your priority list these days. So, over to you. Thanks, General Deptula, and uh, thanks everyone for tuning in. Uh, it's a great opportunity to talk just a little bit about uh, what uh, our airmen, the Joint Force, and our partners are doing here in uh, Europe and Africa. And so I think it's, uh, it, it's only appropriate that I would start a little bit to talk about um, our priorities here and, and some of the things that have been ongoing. And if you would just allow me a couple minutes to talk about that, I'd greatly appreciate it. And so with uh, any priority, I think we have to talk about our people. That's where everything starts. And uh, fundamentally, as all have watched over the course of the last several months, uh, our folks have uh, worked through the, the challenges of COVID. Um, found ways to take care not only of themselves but their families as well and done that in a way that uh, has allowed us to continue our operations across the AOR. And I think it's important um, to, to, to you know, remind folks where we're operating. We're talking from, from the high north into the Baltics, down into the Med, the Black Sea, West Africa, East Africa, so there's no lack, lack of uh, operations that have been ongoing throughout this entire time period. So it's been key for us to you know, work through how we best take care of our folks and their families, particularly in, this, uh, uh, in the European and African uh, environment while recognizing that plenty of them had families that are back in the States working through the challenges of COVID. As we've done that, we've tried to uh, additionally stay clear-eyed about our readiness, particularly for our forces here in Europe. And uh, we've done that really by staying close to our partners and finding ways to train with them and look for opportunities that may have not pre presented themselves previously, but by leveraging distributed capabilities to both brief, fly, and debrief, we've been able to sustain a level of readiness that frankly is is now on the increase acknowledging though for a period of time we did take it take a hit there um, as, as we look at uh, the, the other priority for me it really has to do with our posture and ensuring that uh, not only when we talk about airplanes but also about people and the logistic support to facilitate uh, the required uh, relationships with our partners to be able to execute the operations that we've been tasked in support of uh, not only UCOM, but also AFRICOM. And that posture, as you know, is continually reviewed and uh, one that we've worked hard to ensure, particularly from a logistic perspective. When you think about 104 nations, and again, from the challenges of operating uh, up in the Arctic to uh, the, the vast distances we talk about in Africa, uh, that, that's been something that uh, remains uh, directly in our sights here. And then finally, uh, the other key priority for us is really working the relationships required to uh, ensure that we've got the trust and confidence with our partners. As everyone on the net knows, you, you cannot surge trust. And this is something that as a, an insider force here in Europe, particularly, we've got to find ways to continue to uh, build those relationships and find those mechanisms that allow us to be more than just friends, but fully interoperable partners that are willing to, to uh, step into the fight together to achieve those uh, specific capabilities required to have the muscle memory that allows us to not only deter, but also be prepared to defend day one. So that's kind of a quick synopsis of the priorities and things that are up front on, uh, on our minds over here and uh, happy to uh, go on any one of those uh, that you're interested in. 
Well, thanks for that great overview, uh, Cobra. Now, you know, when we look at today's combat aircraft inventory, we see a force in transition. Our fourth generation fighter capacity is growing, but we still have a significant number of 1980s built fourth generation fighters. Uh, it's the same time we look forward to the B-21. We appreciate the few B-2s that we have, uh, but we're still relying on non-stealth B-1s and B-52s for the bulk of the bomber force. My sense is that demand for fifth generation is growing. And while the areas of pragmatic survivable execution for older types is, is shrinking, um, given the rapid ascent of adversary capabilities, how do you rack and stack the attributes uh, that you need to execute your missions if it came to combat? Well, you know, this is one of my favorite questions. And so, you know, here's, here's, here's my thoughts on this. And I'm going to be really frank with you. I think it's important as an Air Force, we don't forget where we came from. And it starts with air superiority. And we need to make sure that uh, as uh, we we work through the challenges of what could potentially be a, a fairly austere budget environment that we're able to uh, be clear-eyed about the capabilities that we're going to need to operate uh, both from a standing perspective and a standoff perspective to achieve air superiority. And I recognize uh, there will be challenges associated with that, but I would argue, and I'm happy to debate, have this debate with whoever would like to have it with me, that uh, unless you gain air superiority, all the other uh, things that we're we would want to accomplish, particularly with the joint force, will be very difficult to achieve. So when you look across any operation and our reliance on uh, achieving air superiority, whether it be temporal or complete air dominance, uh, it will underpin our joint success. So I think as we look at that and we remind ourselves uh, the importance of it, that, that should inform, I would offer, some of the decisions, particularly as we move forward here. Now, having said that, um, I am fully supportive of where we're going with JADC2 and enabling it with the Advanced Battle Management System, ABMS. I think the uh, recognition that as we take the big idea and operationalize it, for us here, uh, particularly in, in Europe, it will be imperative that we start bringing capabilities as the chief and those that have been working this problem set have envisioned the lead behind experiments, those type, types of capabilities must contribute to what we're providing in the toolkit for the warfighter so that they can have some skin in the game with respect to understanding what ABMS and support of JADC2 is going to bring. Because at the end of the day, uh, we've got to be able to operate at speed. We've got to be able to make decisions in, in a manner that allows us to quickly maintain our advantage over the adversary and allow us, again, to maintain that air superiority and I think that will be uh, be imperative. Having said that, when you talk about um, fourth, fifth gen interoperability, uh, B-21s and, uh, and, the, and the bomber force there, uh, one of the key challenges that we continue to um, analyze and work through from a TTP perspective with these capabilities is the counter IADS problem set. So getting after integrated air uh, air defense systems, particularly those uh, that the Russians possess, is one that uh, I would offer to you, uh, we don't want to train once every three months against. You know, uh, General Tatula, having been a previous Eagle guy, you would know that finding your group as an Eagle guy was your job and you knew how to do it, and you knew how to do it right off the chute. And that's the same way we should approach this counter IS problem in that this should be something that we have muscle memory with and shouldn't be a one-off that we're going to have to go figure out, you know, on the, the first day of the war. And so that's the mindset that, that we need to take. So when you think about um, our training infrastructure, where you're going to train to do this, how you're going to integrate your partners, those are pieces of this particular problem set as we think about where we're um, investing in terms of fifth gen and uh, advanced bombers that all are part of that problem set that I would offer we need to think about. Sorry, probably a little longer answer than you wanted, but I think that's an important part of reminding ourselves uh, why we're the greatest Air Force in the world and why we're going to have partners that get to be part of the plan with us. No, it's a, that was a great answer, Cobra. Really appreciate it. And what's this former Eagle guy? You give me a cockpit and I'll come over there right away, hop in the front seat and uh, 
uh, don't worry, um, I'll make you proud. Um, I would expect right. nothing less from you in the response. Hey, when you commanded the uh, air component during uh, Operation Inherent Resolve, you saw Russian capabilities up close and personal. What were the main observations that you took away from this experience and wh what were the biggest surprises? Uh, how did that inform your current decision-making process? So first off, uh, you know, I was very fortunate to uh, have an opportunity to command uh, downrange with uh, some great airmen and not just great U.S. airmen, but uh, also, also from the coalition and then it, operate in a, in a joint environment that uh, frankly was a, a once in a lifetime experience. And so, uh, you know, this, this question uh, for me, it, it drove me a, a bit to reflect on, uh, you know, probably all you out there have your little green books that you kept your notes in. And, you know, some of them you're like, oh, I probably shouldn't have written that down. But <laughs> that, it, 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 it offered me a chance to think back at, uh, you know, what were the key lessons learned for me? And I guess, the one, while somewhat related to, you know, the Russian piece, which I'll get to in here in a second, I think uh, one of the key areas, and I uh, jumped up to, I think you've heard me talk about this, was the importance of, you know, we can use the word mission command, but what really was about ensuring we empowered uh, our airmen that were out there at the tip of the spear. Uh, my sense was because of the environment that we've been operating in, and for a long time, and it's nobody's fault, but we, we were afforded uh, the opportunity to have time to make decisions. And so a lot of times that would get brought back into the air ops center, into the CAOC back there, where you know, you'd have you know, the AO level, the colonel level, the GO level, everybody gonna, you know, okay, let's talk about what we're gonna do uh, because we had time. Uh, troops in contact, separate situation, but as we started getting to the dynamic environment, of air to air, uh, making decisions that had to be uh, happening within an instant, it was crystal clear to me that we had over-centralized to a level that required us to step back, think about how we provided, I'll call it, you know, the broad guidance and intent of a commander, and then let your commanders operate inside that intent. And um, that may be surprising to some folks, but I think it, it, it was a, you know, a result of what had happened over, you know, several years of, um, I don't want to call it uncontested, but it, it wasn't the type of environment that was driving uh, decisions that needed to happen at speed. And it really wasn't at the speed that we would talk about in a peer fight, but it was clear to me we had to go back to trust in those guys that were um, guys and gals that were at the tip so that they understood the intent. And, and I will tell you that um, as commanders, we frankly needed – to get better about how we provided intent and it you know you you yourself have written air ops directives and you've seen these 30 and 40 50 page hymnals that i i was of the opinion hey this needs to be something that they can digest like this and turn into a decision in flight and so i think it's important that uh as we go forward uh we remind ourselves of those lessons and continue to refine that as you think about i'll, I'll step back to this uh Connor Iad's discussion. You know, while there's there's uh, uh, there's a place for the AOC to provide fusion uh, to manage resources, kind of at the theater level. At the end of the day, it it was clear to me as we worked through the problem set there, you need to go straight from sensor to shooter as quick as possible to provide the effect that was required. And uh, that that to me was uh, an important lesson from not only a um, professional development for our people perspective but also for how we manage the fight um, another one that was uh, I guess one that uh, nobody ever really teaches you you know there's a lot of writing about it but uh, the importance of coalition war fighting and how do you do that and how do you keep the coalition together and frankly it's one of those areas that I believe as Americans uh, we do better than anybody I'm not sure why I, I think it's, it's in, inculcated in our culture of being inclusive, but coalition war fighting, as you know, is not easy. And you're gonna have to thread the needle in terms of how you um, communicate your intent and make sure everybody's got skin in the game. And what I'm reminded is that 
Um, what the coalition offered me was a lot of capabilities and authorities that I didn't have inside the U.S., but they could do things. And that was a huge advantage uh, for us because they were able to deliver effects that, frankly, we couldn't do. And I'm talking not just the air domain, but there were other domains that they were able to contribute to in a manner that were very effective in contributing to our success. And so um, I took that to heart in terms of how I am now talking to uh, squadron commanders, wing commanders, in terms of the importance of building relationships outside our Blue Air Force, some of that then, of course, being in the joint world, but more broadly with those that you one day could be coalition warfighting with, and those are going to be partners that are going to be critical to your success. Um, okay, dealing with the Russians. Um, you know, again, you can read a lot of history books and try to wrap your head around um, dealing with the Russians, but un until you're talking to them, and it wasn't me personally, but our guys talking to them, you know, 10, 20 times a day, you get the true insight and the challenges of dealing with folks that frankly have a different way of searching for gaps and seams in your logic to gain an advantage. And it was information warfare every day with those guys. And uh, to be clear, you know, when they would say something, uh, you know, I've said this before, they were, they were unhindered by the truth and that you had to be prepared to uh, do what you th felt was appropriate. And uh, that, was, that was always an interesting challenge. And I think we learned a lot, at least I did personally, in terms of how they operated through the proxies that they had on the ground in Syria. And, and as you've seen, you know, uh, General Townsend and I, in uh, his role down at AFRICOM, have found that if you're going to compete with the Russians, uh, you better be prepared to expose them and compete in the information environment uh, because that's, that's where you're going to find opportunities available to you. And uh, I would offer collectively as we continue, and 16th Air Force has done a great job of helping us best understand how to uh, find the opportunities to expose and then um, highlight those malign activities that could be impacting security, particularly as it relates to um, – the southern flank of Europe right now. Uh, probably the, the last surprise and one that um, probably should have been more informed about before I took the job out there was uh, really some of the tools that we as an Air Force had been providing our folks that were operating in the AOC. Um, as, as you're well aware, some of those tools probably hadn't kept up with the uh, software development and had the agility we needed to uh, give folks those tools that will allow them to have the awareness of the knowledge to make decisions at the speed that we needed. And so uh, I think we made some good progress uh, with what's been done in DIUX, Kessel Run, and those types of activities. Clearly work to be done as we move to JADC2, but I think we, we ought to capture some of those uh, processes in, turn of, in terms of understanding what the warfighter at the tip needs have that uh, acquisition uh, warfighter interface that allows that to be clear to incrementally bring capabilities that allow us to continue over time to get to the longer term vision of uh, truly optimizing what's pro provided to the airmen or, or joint warfighter to execute uh, the operations we've been given. So. Again, I learned a lot. It was it was a, it was a long two years, but a great two years. Well, that's a spectacular uh, comments and observations in a short period of time. I think what I'm going to do, Cobra, is get a transcript of this, and we'll turn this into uh, a Mitchell Institute forum paper because uh, your your words are uh, are ones that uh, the entire force, not just Air Force, uh, needs to uh, take into consideration. Now, you spoke and you've mentioned already the issue of a joint all domain command and control. And you know the chief's made that sort of the cornerstone of his uh, tenure uh, while he's been chief. And, and clearly this is the sort of capability whose uh, full potential is only gonna be realized through engagement with allies and partners, as you mentioned. Um, so how do you see our friends in Europe and Africa responding to this vision? Are they, are they headed in a similar direction? And uh, what are the key technological and operational uh, factors uh, when uh, building to this vision that we need to keep in mind? So first, they're very interested. And clearly, 
they um, are looking to, as in my words, see themselves in JADC2. How do they fit in? You know, um, if you start with the enabling sensors that they have, whether it be ground radars that are feeding our, our NATO picture, or it's uh, F-35s, or it's the human capital side of the house. They're looking to, first I would say, broadly understand the concept. And you know, fundamentally, what we need to do is continue to turn PowerPoint into action and take a concept paper and has, uh, has been accomplished in some of these uh, experiments with ABMS, but more broadly go, Okay, you know, this is the infamous, in my words, how you take, and I don't know if you were uh, an A5 or an A3 guy, you know, you probably were in the mix there. But, you know, you, you had those situations where the five gives you the, hey, here's the big idea. And then they would try to, you know, dump it over, give it to the three and go, hey, man, go operationalize this. And that's always the challenge. And I think right now they see the, the five, the concept um, and what we need to do, we're trying to work through this right now, is turn it to a con imp and go, all right, how do you um, operationalize this? And then how do you uh, ultimately allow the partners to figure out where they can fit into this? And, you know, many of them uh, see potential niche areas where, where they can visualize themselves participating in it. But at the end of the day, what we're going to have to do is sort out in uh, what I would offer particular vignettes where we can generate some quick wins where they see themselves participating. And, and, and so, you know, for us, uh, there are particular exercises we're looking at, uh, whether it be integrated in air missile defense type exercises here this fall, that we're going to bring them in. And it, while it may be a baby step in terms of JADC2, if there's some incremental capabilities that uh, we've sorted out either in one of the NORTHCOM activities um, or any of the other ones that have been accomplished at Nellis, I'm pushing to bring them here so they can see what those are and then not only uh, intellectually understand it, but have airmen or you know joint partners that may participate that and, and get a better sense and feel of what that is. And I think, I think that'll be the key areas here over the next uh, you know, year, two years, that we've, we've got to, you know, wrap our arms, get them in the, inside the, the tent, if you will. And, you know, jump to two, I'll tell you, one of the things we got to push on hard is the security part of it. If, if you know, this yeah, cannot be a U.S. Laughing because you're so spot on on that. I mean, I, you know, people want to hear your perspectives, but man, the war stories that can be told about um, not even being able to allow allies to show up on the chaos floor when you're in the middle of a major humanitarian uh, relief effort with them are incredible. And that was 10 years ago. When are we gonna fix security and get over the bureaucracy? I mean, come on. Well, so what I would tell you is, and you know, I, General Brown will work through it when, when he takes over, but uh, I know he's of the same mindset and we're, um, and, I, and naturally, you know, General Walters is supporting me on the, on the UCOM side of the house. So um, it needs to be smart risk, but I'm, I'm here to tell you, we can do this and, and we can find ways to do it that, uh, um, you know, without getting into all the classification details, there are ways to bring them in the tent and get them what they need to know and allow them to be key participants from planning through execution and then the debrief. And that's the key. We can't just bring them in and execution and go, hey, we built the plan, sorry, just do what we told you. Yep. We, we need to understand what capabilities they bring, because I'll go back to my coalition war fighting uh, discussion up front. They're, they're gonna bring capabilities that we want and, and they may have access, they may have uh, specific capabilities that'll be important to the plan and our huge contributors to JADC2 or ABMS. And, uh, you know, I, like you, want them in the game with us because that's how we're going to win. And we're not going to win this by ourselves. We're going we're gonna to fight as a coalition. And so we got to figure out um, in, a, uh, in a smart way. And I'm, I am very convinced we can, can do it. I, here's my last point on this. And I, I know you wanted to get me fired up on it. I love getting fired up on this. <laughs> is, you, I mean, you got to allow commanders to make smart risk decisions. And, you know, I, 
there are folks that may not be here, but are making policy decisions. That's their job. But when the forward commander makes a recommendation, because we're here and we're closer to it, we need to be, again, uh, informed by what that commander believes he needs or she needs to do to make that decision. And the security environment should work as hard as they can to get the yes to support that commander. And that's something that, uh, you know, we got to continually work on. I mean, it's, it's the nature of the bureaucracy, but, uh, you know, what I tell my folks is I love fighting that wars for them. So, you know, hey, let, let's figure out where, where the security challenge is and let's get after it. We may not always win, but we're going to have that discussion and do everything we can to get our partners in the game with us. No, that's great to hear. And uh, quite frankly, you know, this is going to be key, like you said, to JADC2. We're not going to operate alone. So in one of the things that technology will be able to help us with is the automated transfer of the levels of access to information without having to have uh, you know, a meeting with the policy folks. If we get to those decisions quickly, then it can be done and facilitated such that folks on the tip of the spear can, uh, can act in a rapid time frame. So speaking of allies, let me expand the discussion a bit. Um, you know, numerous allies and partners in Europe are buying the F-35. What does that do for you? And what does that mean for our ability to partner and collaborate? So first, it's been a uh, really uh, helpful opportunity for us to have this uh, collaboration potential with uh, partners that want to be arm in arm with us. Uh, what I would share with you is, uh, you, you may be aware of this, but uh, early on, General Walters stood up our uh, F-35 users group over here, and then uh, General Brown followed up over in the, in the Pacific. And uh, one of the areas we, sh we struggled with, and you know, this is kind of again, uh, PowerPoint action, but we'd go, eh, F-35 is interoperable. And you go, okay, so what do you mean by that? How does that apply to the operators, the maintainers, those that are, you know, uh, defining, again, security, and how do we work through that? So what we, we laid out is, here was kind of our approach, and I, I just share this with you because I think it was important for us as we worked. We did this with our partners. We said, okay, let's first talk about interoperability between coalition F-35s. How do we make sure the MBFs are the same or, you know, we're, we're sending each other the data that can go from cockpit to cockpit? And then the second tier we looked at is how do we do get F-35 data off to other air domain players? In other words, fourth gen um, to AWACS, those kind of things. And then the third tier was how do we get F-35 data all domain, particularly when you start thinking about F-35 to, for instance, ATACMs or those type capabilities. How do, you, how do you work that piece? And then as we peeled that onion back, we said, well, probably need to, you know, then let's, let's talk about tactical employment. How are we doing with TTPs? Are we actually sharing from the U.S. perspective the lessons that we're learning and how you employ the airplane. Again, you get into some security issues that you got to smoke out to go, all right, yes, we're doing this the right way. And then you get on the logistics side, maintenance side. And so in, in each of these areas, we've not, and then you're going to ask me, well, how you doing? Well, we had to measure them. And what it gave us is an opportunity to go directly to the JPO or whomever was the uh, um, organization that was holding up progress and find ways to measure exactly how we're doing and then go, okay, we're going to go do an exercise here and get after this particular problem set and allow us to continue to see uh, where we are truly interoperable. Because as you do that, then you're going to uncover what was another area that we continue to work, which is operational training infrastructure. How do we train together? And, you know, do we go to the, we go back to Dutchy in Italy and start setting up a fifth gen capability up there? Do we go to the, you know, up to the Norwegians, up to the high north? How are we going to do that? And then, you know, again, one of my favorite questions are, are we going to connect our F-35 simulators so we can train together? Those are the kind of things that um, this discussion has facilitated or really robust um, conversation, not only at the AO level, but at the air chief level, 
to go solve some of these problems. So we're not perfect. We have plenty of work to do. And I could deep dive with you on each one of those. But I think that structure has facilitated a more informed conversation about where we're really at with interoperability amongst F-35s. And we, we've made great progress because uh, General Walters would tell you the same in that um, we're going to need the team here to be able to operate together, whether that be to facilitate data to uh, fourth gen capabilities or to other joint players to get after the mission sets that will be required to deter and defend over here in Europe. And so, again, uh, lots of good progress. Um, we've been able to have those meetings uh, twice a year and it's been uh, really helpful to get uh, not only the AO level together, but then to get the commanders together who can put resources against these particular areas that we want to make progress from an interoperability perspective. Well, it's great to hear on the interoperability front. I'd also um, ask, I think I know the answer to your question, uh, but given all these challenges um, to optimize the use of the F-35, it's got to be great and it's got to be bringing the nations even closer together because they're operating common equipment. You agree with that? Oh, yeah. And uh, you may recall, uh, I guess it was... Uh, I don't know if it was last summer or summer of 18. We, you know, we did, a, we did some interoperability work where one of the uh, key areas that I wanted to achieve success was I wanted to have um, another nation that has F-35s refuel our F-35s. You know, people were like, whoa. <laughs> and we did it. It did it, it did it take some, we're going to do this and get, you know, the team on board to lean into it from, you know, the staff sergeants up to the, you know, uh, policymakers. But we were able to do it and demonstrate it safely. And those, you know, those kinds of activities, while they sign, sound like, oh, that's, you know, that's really not that big of a deal. It was a big deal. And that's, you know, when you go back to the, you know, having trusting in each other, um, those are the kinds of things when you're doing that not only only with your maintainers, but also then you're flying, you know, two Norwegian F-35s, two Italian F-35s, and two American F-35s. That's why people are buying the airplane. And that is combat power. And that in itself, when the Russians see that you got three nations that are employing together, that's deterrence. And uh, we, we ought not forget that. Outstanding. Listen, uh, Cover, I want to leave some time for our uh, audience, but I got one more question for you before we go to audience um, uh, Q&A. Uh, Mitchell Institute recently uh, released a report discussing the difficulty of equipping allies and partners with uh, U.S. manufactured UAVs due to the provisions of the missile technology control regime uh, because it characterizes these uninhabited aircraft in the same class as nuclear weapons delivery vehicles. Could you speak to how you see demand from partner nations to gain access to U.S. UAVs and the need for the U.S. to meet it? Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, as you're well aware, I've had uh, many an air chief talk to me about what it's going to take for them to gain their own MQ-9s or uh, some other UAS type capability. And, you know, not, not to sound flippant about this, but here's what I saw happen. If we didn't sell it to them, the Chinese sold it to them. And, or we, we had to try to talk them out of buying another one because they'd look at us and say, well, you won't sell it to us. And so I think we, we've got to be thoughtful about how we work our way through uh, the intricacies of, of uh, um, the policies associated with this. Because at the end of the day, uh, what I would argue is that what we're finding and what we're learning now with some of the new UAS capabilities is that uh, when you talk a uh, great power competition, it, and let me step back. I think a lot of people look at a you know an MQ-9 and go, ah, oh, that's going to be counter VEO. And I'm like, well, not anymore. There, are, if you're thoughtful about how you employ these things and where you're going to operate and how you're going to use it from an INW perspective or deterrence perspective, because they know you're there and looking. Um, I, I am wholeheartedly in, in favor of our friends across Europe having a capability that allow us to do more of that, given that we're, we're going to be sharing that information and it all contributes to the INW, we, the collective we, 
need to have the necessary essay on a potential adversary uh, activities. And you know, you can make the argument about what, what that means uh, down in Africa as well, given what both China and Russia are doing in Africa. I mean, all you gotta do is go look at a map and you can probably go to Google and look at all the locations they're in and, and either what they're trying to procure or what they're doing from an infrastructure perspective and uh, getting uh, data, intel, pictures that allow us to expose those types of activities are things that we need to be cognizant of. And you know, uh, let's be clear, the, the Russians know when we got satellites coming overhead. I can give you a bazillion examples of that. And so we've gotta be creative in the ways that allow us to have um, resilient opportunities to collect and affording our, our, our partners, our valued partners who you know, make a sound argument for having these capabilities and we trust them to you know, leverage them in the appropriate fashion is something that I believe we need to take a hard look at and, uh, and give you know, uh, consideration to. Well, excellent. We've come to the end of our uh, discussion, or at least this portion. So thanks, Cobra, for your superb insights. Um, they really were uh, excellent and uh, informative. As an alert to our listeners, our next events on uh, July 1st, when the Mitchell Institute will host uh, Air Force Materiel Commander uh, General Arnie Bunch. Okay, now we're going to open up the sex, sex session uh, to questions from the audience who've been listening. And I would uh, remind our listeners to pre please use the raise hand function uh, on the app. Uh, and when I call on you, unmute your mic and uh, please uh, state your name. So with that, let's go to our first question from uh, Michael Gordon of uh, Wall Street Journal. Um, uh, hi, General Harigian. I have uh, two questions for you, uh, related questions. On uh, June 18th, uh, you said in a different forum that you had not um, received any guidance uh, from DOD to do any planning with regard to President Trump's decision to cut uh, U.S. Uh, uh, troops in Germany in half and put a 25,000 cap on it. And my first question is, is that still the case? Have you in the past uh, couple of weeks received some directives or guidance about to do some planning on this and and uh, what are the implications of um, of that decision for you? And I have a follow-up question. Hey Michael, good to uh, hear from you and uh, to uh, follow up on uh, the June 18th uh, interview. Nothing's changed uh, at, at this particular point. Uh, we have not received that guidance, and uh, again, I'd ask you to, to you know, go back to uh, the, uh, the administration and back at the White House for any further questions on it. My second question, this, this, real, this is within your uh, purview. I've, I've noticed that um, uh, there have been a lot of uh, bomber task force operations in Europe recently, pretty interesting ones, B-1s over the Black Sea, B-52, and Baltic B-2 over Iceland. And... Um, Though I'm a layman, it, it appears to me that this is a more active um, rhythm for the bomber task force in the past. Um, could you please explain, you know, the logic of what uh, you're trying to do here? Or is uh, what why this is is it indeed the case that they're happening more frequently than in the past? Uh, why is that so? And is this um, are you trying to signal that the U.S. still has military capability, even though we're um, dealing with COVID at home. What, what's your um, thinking here, please? Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Michael. That's a great question. And as you highlight, we have uh, been able to, uh, through COVID, find opportunities to leverage, uh, frankly, a, a great working relationship uh, with STRATCOM and Global Strike to uh, leverage their capabilities in coordination and synchronization with our partners. Uh, and as you highlighted uh, very factually, we've been able to do that uh, from the high north uh, into the Black Sea. And, and fundamentally, this, this is a part of what we do for um, a deterrence perspective and to ensure that um, as we work through the challenges of COVID and, and planned and executed these sorties, uh, this was to demonstrate uh, that from a, a coalition perspective, uh, and in some, some particular cases, this was done in coordination with NATO, 
we were able to generate uh, these sorties and coordinate them uh, from across Europe to facilitate uh, training opportunities, uh, demonstrate interoperability, and at the end of the day, ensure that uh, as we continue to refine uh, what I'll call our muscle memory to operate across Europe, the, these bomber task force afford us, afforded us a tremendous uh, opportunity to do that. And so we took advantage of it. And so, uh, you know, I would fully expect over time, we're gonna continue to execute these. Some have asked me, you know, when are we gonna go back to Fairford and those type of activities? And I don't wanna get into the, the details of that, but at some point we will continue those operations as we, as we have previously executed, as we continue to execute these that launch from the CONUS. But, but again, thanks for the question. Uh, uh, we have found great value in these uh, bomber task force missions. Is it fair to say you're doing it more than in the past? I would say that uh, what we've been able to do is, uh, it, it depends how you look at the numbers, but we've been able to generate uh, uh, more in a very uh, consistent time period than we had done previously. Thank you. Okay, Sarah Sirota. Hey, thank you so much for doing this, General. Um, I wanted to go back to the JADC2 ABMS experimentation that you were talking about. Um, can you identify a specific exercise in the near term that you're considering uh, hosting an ABMS demonstration during? Um, what leave behind capabilities you might be interested in and um, whether you're specifically interested in uh, the Air Force's platform one for software development? Thanks. Yeah, hey, thanks, Sarah. Uh, so right now what we've been uh, planning on is uh, leveraging uh, a spring 21 exercise uh, here in Europe to bring in some uh, capabilities that would allow us to work through, um, I'll, I'll use the term layered ISR capabilities and uh, allowing us to work some sensor to shooter specifics and uh, due to the the classification, it gets a little bit uh, challenging to talk about some of that, but the goal here will be to refine ultimately our timelines to take the data from uh, different sensors and provide those to shooters that would be um, available to us. And as you can imagine, there, there's some different, uh, different ones that would be involved with that. Um, meanwhile, though, I would highlight to you that what we're looking to do is as uh, the, these on-ramps occur, We've got folks that are attending uh, each of those with the goal here of being at uh, another one, I think planned at Nellis in the fall, that we, we hope to be able to garner some of those um, software applications that we could leverage in either our op center or um, from a reach back capability that would facilitate the speed that we're talking about when we uh, work the sensor to shooter uh, problem sets that inevitably are ones that we've got to uh, be able to operate with and uh, through over here in Europe. So that's our approach. Uh, we are um, working closely with uh, the headquarters Air Force team and AFWIC to uh, fine tune the specifics of those capabilities that we would like to leave behind. And right now, I, I don't have the specifics at this point, but, but uh, I would suspect here in the next couple months, we'll be able to uh, gain some uh, clarity on, on those that uh, I certainly want to ensure we leave back here for our folks. And would you have any European countries participating in the Spring 21 event? That's the plan. Uh, as we talked about earlier, it is critical to us that we're, we're able to do that. We are uh, working through um, who and uh, what that might mean. And at this point, I don't have uh, that locked down yet. As soon as we do, we'll, we'll be sure to talk about that. Okay, thanks, Sarah. How about uh, Garrett uh, uh, Ream? General, this is Garrett Ream with Flight Global. Um, my question is about the MQ-9 that uh, you acknowledged was uh, shot down last November over Libya. Um, and I wondered, um, given your experience uh, especially over the last 12 to 24 months, have you 
uh, any lessons learned or thoughts on how you might change the way you fly the MQ-9 in the Middle East, as well as the lessons learned in the Middle East, is that how does that inform how you might fly the MQ-9 or other large UAVs uh, against Russia or China? Hey, that's a great question. And uh, you know, going back to my time uh, at uh, Air Force's Central Command, uh, we continue to learn an awful lot about how uh, to optimize our use of MQ-9s in a theater where it, it can quickly become contested. Um, and, you know, the, the key for, for us, given where the RPA operates, how it operates, is it really starts with our indications and warning and understanding of the environment that we're going to um, ask the, uh, the platform to operate in. I would tell you that uh, as, as we've refined the ways that we think about uh, employing these capabilities, um, it, it, you know, so job one is to recognize that uh, we need to understand uh, the value of the collect that we're asking the airplane or uh, the RPA to, to collect for us. That's, that's naturally gonna drive some risk decisions, uh, again, depending upon the threat and what we're looking to, to get after there. Um, the other part of, uh, uh, you know, naturally what we've, we've learned over time is, um, you know, there, there's something to be said for um, operating in a manner that um, um, offers us an op opportunity to not be as predictable as we may have been previously. I think, uh, you know, over time we, we developed some TTPs that uh, were probably a bit too predictable and uh, this was from years and years of operating in a counter VEO environment. And so if you uh, facilitate um, tactics that allow you to be a bit more unpredictable, um, be clear eyed about where the threat is and what you can uh, do to mitigate that threat. It afford and, and you put some, uh, I'll call it advanced capabilities, not only on the, uh, the MQ-9, but you layer it with other other intel capabilities, it, it, it makes the platform much more survivable and uh, allows you to then collect on those areas that you're interested in collecting on. Okay, uh, Cobra, we've got uh, about uh, two and a half minutes left. I've got a text question from uh, Gene uh, Germanovich, and here it is. As Europeans acquire the F-35, do you see enough emphasis from these allies on the things that are needed to maximize the value of fifth generation beyond the airframes themselves? Hey, that's a great question. And uh, actually what I would tell you is uh, their emphasis on the, the human capital side of the house in terms of okay, uh, we've got a fifth generation platform, but we have to have fifth generation minds and people that think in a different way about solving problems. And I can give you um, several allies that fundamentally have raised that as their key, um, their key point for how they want to um, transform their Air Force going forward. And, and, and frankly, it is exactly the right mindset because you can have this uh, fantastic piece of uh, machinery, but at the end of the day, there's still a human in there that's got to think their way through not only how they operate the platform, but how does it fit into the broad, broader joint architecture and become a node in that architecture that either is providing data off the aircraft, um, executing kinetic and non-kinetic activities. And that, that, that comes from the, the folks that uh, have a culture of fifth gen thinking. And um, I, I have to tell you that the, the F-35 user group and the ideas that have been generated from that reflect that thinking. And, and to me, that, that's really where we need to continue to foster the conversation and continue to find ways that we train not only in the air, but via simulation and virtual um, and synthetic opportunities, because uh, that's truly where we're gonna unleash the, the true power that the, uh, the F-35 and the people bring to, uh, to our organizations. Well, what a great way to finish up, uh, wrap up this uh, session, uh, Cobra. 
Um, uh, we really appreciate you taking the time uh, to do this for us. Uh, and uh, to you and all in our audience from all of us at Mitchell Institute, um, I wish you all a great aerospace power kind of day. Thanks, Jim. The tool has been great. Thanks, everybody. And uh, Cobra, please give up my regards to Kathy. All right. You say hi, Dan. We'll take all care. Right. Bye bye. Listen. All right. See you.